Okay. You, you got the slides? Yeah. Good to man. Took over there, ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hey, how y'all doing this evening? Good. Good. Hey, so uh, first, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Colonel Pat Miller. I'm the installation commander for Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, and the commander for the 88th Air Base Wing. Uh, and so thanks uh, for coming on out here and being part of uh, this uh, public session, if you will, uh, as we talk a little bit about our air installations uh, compatibility use zone study uh, that we just recently accomplished. Um, the great thing about this is uh, this is tied to the community, and that's one of the things I love about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is the amazing community that we have around us. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm passionate about is, de is developing deliberate relationships, uh, and part of that is the relationships that we have with our community partners. Uh, this study rolls in, uh, you know, uh, Montgomery County, Greene County, uh, you know, Miami County, Clark County, a lot of the different municipalities, all the folks that have a relationship with the installation, either because you touched the installation or you're touched by the installation. Uh, one of the things that you hear often about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, is it's the largest single site employer in the state of Ohio. And I think that's interesting, right? Uh, that, that's really interesting because of the economic impact that the installation has uh, to the surrounding communities. Uh, but that's not why Wright-Pat is special, right? Wright-Patterson is special because of the community. Yes, we exist for the defense of our nation, right? This is absolutely a war fighting platform. When you look at the mission sets that operate out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and you think about all the research and development that starts here in the birthplace of aviation, right? Innovation started in the Dayton area and continues in the Dayton area through our Air Force Research Lab. Then you look at how we procure things across the Air Force through the Life Cycle Management Center. Everything from munitions to aircraft, uh, from body armor to PT gear, uh, all those things are generated through the Life Cycle Management Center. You look at education and research and development through our Air Force Institute of Technology. Uh, you look at our flying mission and our reserve partners in the 445th and the C-17s that we operate out of here. Uh, you look at the importance during a hurricane season and the additional aircraft that we come into this area as we support our coastal bases uh, that may be in line for a natural disaster and they evacuate those aircraft to our area. You look at the support with the other uh, uh, Air Force installations around this state uh, and uh, you hear the F-16s flying or the F-15s flying and all these other aircraft as we're supporting training missions. Uh, and there's so many other things that happen on this installation because of where we're located uh, the freedom of maneuver that we have, uh, and then the reach just goes uh, further and further. You look at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center and the way they feed intel to not just the Air Force, uh, but the Space Force and other governmental ent entities. Uh, the stand, stand up of the National Space Intelligence Center. You know, all of these things that are going on at Wright Patterson, that's what makes this base a warfighting platform, right? Uh, from our aircraft to our research. Uh, education. And then we capture all that history with the amazing resource of the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Right? And so you want to know why we exist. You just tour that museum. Uh, and many of the aircraft that you see there have gone through here. As a matter of fact, uh, this Saturday, uh, the museum has worked in welcoming a KC-135. Right? And so that's going to arrive here on Saturday, uh, be on display, and be part of the museum. And so it's really amazing uh, the connections that we have to history. Uh, and the connections that we're going to have to the future, right? And again, we're special because of the support of our community, uh, the relationships that we have with our community. We work hard to recruit and retain local talent uh, to, work, to try and preserve that here in the Miami Valley region, right? And our connections to schools and hospitals and all those things. And, you know, uh, the, the, the ability of the community to support the installation and the people that work and serve here on this installation is, is uh, uh, truly heartwarming, because uh, we have roughly 30,000 plus folks that are employed here at Wright Pat, uh, but those 30,000 plus folks don't live here on Wright Pat. They live in your community. They're your neighbors, scout leaders, teachers, uh, you know, they're in your churches, uh, spouses, kids, uh, and so again, we're great because of the relationships that we have. The fact that we are embedded as part of the community, Wright Pat is the community, the community is Wright Pat. And so that's why we hold these public sessions, to be able to talk about some of the things uh, that impact the community uh, and how the community supports us and how we support the community, uh, to talk about uh, air installation compatibility use zones, 
uh, in this study, how this study feeds into a compatibility use plan, and how the ACUS and the compatibility use plan help inform uh, development around the installation, right? Uh, so that we can protect the great resource that we have here at Ray Patterson Air Force Base, and we continue to be a valuable part of this community and a critical part of our national defense, All right? And so thanks for coming out. Uh, you don't want to hear from me, though. You want to hear from the experts that are going to talk about this plan. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Noah Fillion is going to kind of walk us through the lay of the land here for the uh, brief that we're going to give. Uh, and then uh, the really important part is uh, when you get an opportunity to check out the, the different booths, uh, you see them highlighted by the posters in the back. That's really the slides that we're going to talk about. And we're going to have experts staged at each one of those areas uh, to be able to answer those, uh, those uh, tough questions that you may have of uh, the ACUS and why and where and how and all those types of things. And so we'll cover that information here uh, and then uh, let you loose to kind of ask questions to the different experts uh, at the uh, different uh, booths that are out there. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to Noah and say the floor is yours, man. Thank you, sir. Welcome everybody to the Ray Patterson Air Installations Compatible Use Zone Study uh, Open House. Uh, I'm Noah Fillion from the 88th Civil Engineer Group. I'm the Ray Patterson uh, ACUS Program Manager. Um, there's a few other gentlemen here today uh, with me. Mr. Uh, Gary Thompson is the Air Force Civil Engineer Center, or AFCEC. He's the uh, Enterprise-wide Air uh, ACUS Program Manager. And Mr. Matt Butwin is the from Prospect Hill Consultant. He was the primary uh, consultant that helped us develop this study and put this, uh, this open house together for us. Um, so just to cover the agenda real quick, we're already starting the presentation. This will probably go to roughly about 6.45, at which point we will release everyone to, to go uh, ask questions and, and review the, the, the five booths we have in the back here. Um, and then we'll close at about 7.30. We'll ask everyone to, to find their, their belongings at that point. Um, and just as a reminder, there at where you signed in at the beginning of, or at the back of the room, if you haven't signed in, please sign in. Uh, and there's also a citizen's booklet there uh, up for grabs if you need one. Um, the uh, uh, next slide, please. A little bit more housekeeping. Um, if you have questions that, that uh, the, the folks at the booth can't answer, we do have um, a few uh, email options for you. You can email directly to the, the Wright Patterson Installation Planning Group, or you can send it to Wright Patterson Public Affairs. Um, also, if, if you're willing to, you can write the question down right at the site uh, at one of the booths and put your contact information down if you want contacted directly. That's an option as well. All the materials are on our Wright Pat AQ site. It's listed here. Uh, don't worry if you don't have that written down right now. We'll list it here at the very end of the QR code that'll link you directly to the, uh, the materials. Um, now I'm going to Turn it over to um, to Gary Thompson from AFCEC to talk a little bit about why we're updating this AQ study now and what the process was for, well, for us, but for any installation that is going through an AQ study right now. So, Gary? Thank you. Um, so, I'd like to start off by talking about what the goal of the AQ's program is, and that is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of those living and working near our air installations while simultaneously sustaining the military's operational flying mission at an installation. So we do this through the ACU study. The ACU study provides the Air Force's recommendation to the surrounding community to aid in development of local planning mechanisms that will achieve those safety and mission sustainment goals. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base utilizes operational planning noise contours to help define the area where land use controls are recommended to maintain public and mission safety. An uh, important point I wanted to hit on here is that an ACU study is an advisory document. It's up to the municipalities surrounding the installation uh, whether they adopt the recommendation into their codes, uh, much like they have in the past during previous versions of this study. So, next slide, please. Um, so, why was the study updated? Uh, well, that started in 2020 when the installation reached out to us at AFCEC about uh, requesting an update. So uh, some of the changes that drove this update were uh, changes that took place around the installation and land use prior to or since the last study uh, update of AFI 32-7063 and AFI 32-1015. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar, AFI is Air Force Instruction, and those two AFIs that I listed are the instructions or guidance uh, primarily covering the 
uh, air installation compatible use program, compatible use zone <coughs> program for the Air Force, and the installation planning uh, AFI for the Air Force. So, and also the inclusion of the hazard to aircraft flight zones was in this study. So, what that is, is a consultation zone for project applicants and local planning bodies to consult with the Air Force on project compatibility. Next slide, please. So, the process that went into updating the study uh, consisted of four parts. Uh, data gathering, analysis, review, and public outreach. Uh, the data gathering included things like looking at general air operations, noise abatement procedures, land use and zoning, and as I mentioned earlier, changes that had taken place since the previous ACU study had been conducted. Uh, the analysis uh, portion was assessing land use compatibility within the ACU's footprint. And then the review was when the project team and the installation all got together and reviewed the document. And then the public outreach is what we're doing tonight, where we had the open house and we, we all come up here and talk. And then also we have the materials that you've seen here in the back of the room with us. So um, next up, uh, we have a video that goes into a little bit more detail about the ACU's process. Of As part of a training mission, safety is paramount. Every time that we go to fly, we ensure that we're respectful of the community and our neighbors. In dealing with encroachment issues, it's really important to have all kinds of partners in making positive changes. There's nothing better than being able to find out early complete information about properties that are around you. We're postured to, uh, to complete our mission. And, uh, and to do it in an uh, environment that uh, I think uh, has a very minimal impact on our community. ACUS has allowed us to do that. The U.S. military plays a significant role in defending the United States and its interests around the globe. At the forefront of this endeavor are the aviation assets of the U.S. military. Whether through the global reach of U.S.-based strategic forces, based on aircraft carriers, amphibious ships patrolling the seas, or forward deployed at overseas bases, aviators of all services provide a quick response to world events. The military's success in these endeavors has been achieved because it holds a distinct advantage in advanced technologies that allow it to function more efficiently and effectively. As important as these technologies are to mission success, it is the commitment of the men and women in uniform and the training they receive at home that gives them the proficiency they need when called to action. Success relies on training that is realistic, including the use of full weaponry, live ordnance, and training at all times of day and night. Historically, Military installations have been located in rural areas, which work better for security and allow for an ample buffer between military activities and civilian communities. Over time, however, military installations have become magnets for commercial and residential development because of the economic and employment opportunities that these installations offer. Military airfields are a major contributor to the local community and economy. This contribution may increase development around the base. When incompatible development occurs, there is the potential to expose residents to increased noise levels and safety risks, while potentially threatening the installation's flying mission. In 1973, the Department of Defense created a tool to assist communities in understanding the impacts associated with military airfields and to promote development compatible with air operations. This tool is known as the Air Installations Compatible Use Zones Program, or ACUS. The goal of the ACUS program is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of those living and working on or near military installations by encouraging land use that is compatible with aircraft operations. ACUS is a wonderful program, and so with a great foundation based in the details of ACUS, we're able to establish with our communities where and how compatible growth can take place. 
and build an optimal environment for both us and the community. At the core of the ACUS program are recommendations for land uses in areas exposed to various levels of noise and accident potential. The initial step in the ACUS process is preparation of a study to establish noise contours. The DOD and other federal agencies generally use the day-night average sound level metric, or DNL, to describe long-term noise exposure from operations. <coughs> DNL does not represent the noise from a single aircraft operation, but rather represents the total accumulation of all aircraft operational noise over a 24-hour period. It takes into account the maximum noise level, the duration of events, and the number of events that occur over a 24-hour period, as well as the time of day. For operations between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., the DOD adds a 10 decibel penalty to each noise event to account for the increased sensitivity when ambient noise levels at night are low. California uses a similar metric to DNL called Community Noise Equivalent Level, or CNEL. Unlike DNL, CNEL also adds a 5 decibel penalty to the evening hours of 7 p.m. until 10 p.m. when family indoor and outdoor activities could be impacted by the increased noise annoyance. Noise contours are developed by a computerized analysis of aircraft activity at the installation and reflect site-specific aircraft operational data. For land use planning purposes, the noise exposure area is divided into three zones. The first zone, greater than 75 decibels DNL or CNEL, is an area of high noise exposure, where the greatest degree of land use control is recommended. Residential is not compatible within this zone and should be highly discouraged. Between 65 and 75 decibels DNL or CNEL, lies an area of moderate noise exposure where some land use control is recommended. Residential development is also incompatible within this zone and should be discouraged. Below 65 decibels DNL or CNEL is an area of low noise impact where most land uses are compatible. Residential uses are generally considered compatible within this zone. Land use recommendations are applied to keep noise sensitive uses such as residences, auditoriums, and schools outside of the high noise zones. Recently, uh, we had a request for development uh, that was very similar to a different development that the ACUs uh, supported uh, from a guidelines perspective. Uh, however, um, uh, from a Randolph perspective and a, uh, our mission equities, uh, we were opposed to this development. Part of its development was in a 65 uh, decibel curve, uh, which allowed us to suggest to the city that this not be uh, rezoned for residential and remain as general business uh, to support the mission. While noise concerns are considered a high priority, the safety of the surrounding community is one of the primary purposes for the ACUS program. Safety is paramount in executing a training mission here at Luke Air Force Base. As part of that, every time that we go to fly, we ensure that we have disciplined execution to the local flying procedures, be they departure procedures, arrival procedures, or execution in the airspace, to ensure that we're respectful of the community and our neighbors here. The Department of Defense uses Accident Potential Zones, or APZs, to show areas where an accident is most likely to occur, if one occurs. The worst thing that could happen with incompatible development and accident potential zones is the loss of life. And so it's very important that we try to keep these areas clear of development to the best of our ability. APZs are located below aircraft flight tracks near the ends of runways. There are three accident potential zones. Clear zones are the area with the greatest potential occurrence of aircraft accidents and should remain undeveloped. APZ-1 is the area immediately beyond the clear zone and possesses a moderate but measurable potential for accidents relative to the clear zone. 
APZ2 is the area immediately beyond APZ1 and possesses a lower but still measurable accident potential. But the chance of an accident is remote. They do happen. On this site, over a decade ago, in October 2006, an F-16 crash shortly after takeoff, just outside the accident potential zone. It's because of the efforts of local community leaders, elected officials, and the military that we were able to keep this agricultural land free of places like churches, community centers, and other population centers. The Federal Aviation Administration and the Department of Defense also have defined flight safety zones around airfields and below aircraft departure and approach flight tracks. For the safety of aircraft, the height of structures such as cell towers, buildings, and wind farms and vegetation is restricted within these zones. Other safety criteria that should also be examined for compatibility include uses that produce dust, smoke, or steam, which may obscure pilot vision, uses that generate direct or reflected lighting, uses that produce electromagnetic interference that could interfere with aircraft navigation, communication, and other systems, and uses that could attract birds to the vicinity of the runway. We've certainly seen our share of issues with development, but there are also a lot of different kinds of impacts to our mission. For example, with the endangered species, uh, that would affect the hours of our training, or with light encroachment, we can't be as effective with our night vision goggles and the night vision field condition training that we need to conduct. So the worst thing is curtailing the mission or even making it very difficult to accomplish. And, and certainly that's something we're trying to avoid. Noise contours, accident potential zones, and height and obstruction criteria, along with land use recommendations, are incorporated into the ACU studies for all Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps installations. The ACU study is then presented to the community to assist local governments in developing land use plans that are compatible with airfield operations. Everyone has a role in ACU's implementation. It is up to the military to ensure that its impacts on the community are as minimal as possible, while not degrading the flying mission. Wherever possible, hush houses and test cells are utilized to reduce the noise of engine maintenance run-ups, and noise abatement techniques are incorporated. New missions are examined, and updated ACU studies are provided to the community. Local and regional governments should incorporate the ACU's planning guidelines into comprehensive plans, zoning, disclosure ordinances, and building codes. Builders should incorporate sound insulation into residences in high noise zones, and real estate professionals should disclose possible military impacts to potential buyers. The role played by the Department of Defense in defending the United States and its interests necessitates continued training by our military aviators. To this end, it is essential that there are military installations where aviators can hone their skills so they're ready when the call goes out. The ACUS program provides the tools necessary to promote compatible development and activities near military installations. By working together, the military and the community will help to preserve the defense mission while improving the quality of life for those who live outside the fence. So that, that's a really good overview video of why the Air Force has the ACUS program. It's not only to protect the flight mission, but also to protect uh, the citizens just outside the installation. Um, so that's the reason for that. We want to provide that here for everyone today. Um, so now going to uh, the next portion of our presentation covers the, the uh, we're going to go a quick overview of each one of the boots that are in the back that, um, that we're about to release everyone to. We're not going to go into a deep um, dive informationally on these right now up here. I'm just going to introduce you to the topic so you have an understanding of what types of questions to ask um, and who to talk to when you go back there. Um, so the 
again, there's ask the questions. If, you, if we can't answer the questions, we will take the questions uh, or also feel free to email them in uh, and we will post those up on the site afterwards. Uh, the first booth uh, is the installation mission and context intro. Uh, this covers kind of the flying mission at Wright-Patterson, the primary being the 445th Air Wing, amongst some others. Uh, talks about the, the history of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and its uh, military history and its uh, economic impact in the Dayton region. And leading that booth will be Mr. Mike Tibbs, uh, the installation planning chief for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So you can talk to him about any of the, the topics there. The second booth is our operational overview. Uh, what you see here is the arrival flight tracks, departure flight tracks, and uh, closed uh, pattern flight tracks. Um, uh, to, to give a lot more details on this, we will have an operations or uh, OSS uh, person available. Mr. Ron Alcantara will be the, the booth lead for that one. He will answer any questions that you may have. Um, and then the third booth is the composite acres map, which for which I'm going to be the, the booth lead on. And to aid in that, I have added a 3D cutout here on the top left corner of the, the image to, to explain what the imaginary surfaces are. So in the video, you, you heard a lot about uh, physical obstructions or visual obstructions or possible UI interference. Uh, but these surfaces are different uh, elevations above the, the uh, runway elevation, and that's where we want to restrict or prohibit any, or do our best to, to, to avoid any of those obstructions in those areas. And that's what's shown in the bottom right further corner there, but being a plan view over top is very difficult to understand the heights of, of what that be, what that would be. And it ranges from zero feet above the uh, runway all the way up to 500 feet. Uh, so I want to provide that cut out there. The middle image is the the, uh, the noise contours for our, our planning operational uh, contour and the, the blocked colors there are the same uh, clear zones and accident potential zones that you heard about in the video. So for the other uh, booth overviews, I'll pass it back to you over to uh, Mr. Matthew Butler. Sure, uh, thanks everyone. So um, this is an ACUS program overview uh, poster, which is uh, uh, booth number four. Uh, Gary Thompson's gonna be the lead uh, at that booth. A lot of this information is covered in the ACUS video we just watched, so we don't need to reiterate it, but if you have any additional questions at the booth, that'd be great. The, the high point takeaways are, you know, compatibility with the aircraft operations at the installation and encouraging compatible development in the appropriate areas. So we take the noise contours and the accident potential zones, overlay them on local municipal land use and zoning layers to understand the compatibility in these different areas. So, um, you know, as noted in the video, we uh, want, uh, you know, noise sensitive uses such as residential is discouraged in high noise zones and people intensive uses such as schools and malls and stuff are, uh, not, are not encouraged in accident potential zones. So this is just a generalized um, land use category matrix of the different sort of compatibility um, uh, uh, within the different noise and APZ features. So our last booth is roles and responsibilities. Our fifth booth. Um, the lead there is going to be T.J. Bernard. This one is talks about, and this is a chapter in the ACU study that talks about exactly that roles and responsibilities. So the DoD obviously took the lead with developing the ACU study, uh, performing the analysis, and, and, and developing these materials, and having this open house today. Um, so the next step is to um, encourage the local municipalities to um, adopt this and incorporate it to comprehensive planning, zoning ordinances, and stuff like uh, things of that nature. Again, to strengthen that community relationship with the with the installation. Um, in addition, um, the community has has a role as well. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that, that folks can do. Coming to a meeting such as this and just being informed is is a definitely a, a, a good step. And so, we encourage that sort of uh, communication, two way communication and uh, coordination. Um, so that's that wraps up our booths. I'm going to turn it over to Carol Miller for some closing remarks. So, so the, first, I appreciate the team. Uh, the whole purpose of the presentation piece is kind of introduce why we do uh, ACUS, right? Um, part of this is us identifying to the community the impact of the mission sets on the installation, right? Uh, transparency is important. Understanding uh, the outcomes of the mission sets that happen on an installation and how it could impact the surrounding community is important to understand. And that's why the relationship with the counties, the relationship with the municipalities uh, comes into play uh, so that they can take these things into consideration when establishing guidance. 
uh, developmental guidance uh, in, in their areas. Uh, but it's also to understand the impact that the community could have on the installation. Right? As we develop things that are potentially incompatible, uh, it puts both people uh, and missions at risk. Right? And so again, part of the transparency in the conversation of mission sets and understanding what happens on an installation uh, and the relationship with the community uh, is important because we lean on the community uh, for support. We are part of the community, the community is part of us. Uh, and so having that understanding is why we have these public sessions. Uh, to have that dialogue, to show the results of the studies that are going on out there. Uh, this is a part, a feeder part, that also goes into a study that I had mentioned previously, a compatibility use plan. Uh, one of the great things about our surrounding municipalities is they form what's called a council of governance. Uh, and so that council is helping us uh, advocate for award of a compatibility use plan, which we received funding for. Uh, and that compatibility use plan is moving forward. And that's looking at all the other areas around the installation and figuring out how do we exist together uh, in harmony to make sure that we are protecting the resources both on the installation and off the installation. Uh, and we continue and we can continue to be the valuable resource that we are uh, for our nation's defense. And we continue to be great partners together uh, in the community. Right? And, and that's really the end goal of this. And so I encourage you to take some time uh, to visit these different booths and talk to the experts that can kind of deep dive into the questions that you may have on why, how, what, what does this mean, what can we do, uh, what went into account uh, whenever we were uh, developing this uh, air installations compatibility use zone study uh, and how that potentially feeds into other things that are going on. Okay, uh, So take advantage of that. Uh, I know Noah is going to come up and give uh, a, a few other ROEs just uh, as you work your way around. It will also give our folks that are uh, going to staff these booths uh, opportunities to get to those locations. Uh, so that if you have any questions, you, you know where you're going. And so he'll kind of give you that roadmap. Uh, but uh, ask away. All right. That's what the public sessions are for, is for you to engage and ask uh, uh, any questions that you have uh, at, at the different booths that are out there. And so I will step off the stage uh, with a, a final thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for being part of this endeavor. Right? Uh, thanks for challenging us, uh, and thanks for working with us. Right? Uh, because without each other, uh, this can't be successful. Right? And so I appreciate your time uh, and you being here tonight. No, I hand it back over to you. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, and I have echo the thanks as well to the team that helped put the study together and put this event together. Uh, it could not have been done without the entire team. Um, so now uh, the booths are going to be opened up. Uh, remember, we have all five available. I'm going to leave this slide up here for everyone to see to remember the names of individuals at the booths. There's name tags at the booths as well, or name plates. So if you have a question, that's who you want to talk to. Um, again, you can email the questions in. Uh, this site, you scan the QR code, go right to our uh, right pad ACUS site so you can download any of the materials that you uh, are interested in. Um, with that, I look forward to talking to you at the booths. Thank you.